Our next segment is the panel discussion by six prominent human rights activists who will be presenting their case against Sharia courts, Beth Dean, legal aid cuts, and the denial of access to equality, to equality and human rights. Now, um, we've, we've, t we've told you earlier that we've tried to reach out to the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance to join the panel today uh, to discuss the situation of Batadin. However, we haven't received any response from them, so we probably would be only focusing on Sharia law, more, uh, which is quite likely. Um, in our panel today, we have Gita Sagal, who is the director of the Center for Secular Space, Pragna Patel, who is the director of the South of Black Sisters. We've got Mariam Namazi, director and co-spokesperson for the One Law for All and the Council of Ex-Muslims Britain. We've got Nasrin Rahman, who is the co-founder of British Muslims for Secular Democracy. And finally, we've got Yasmin Khan, uh, who is a women's rights campaigner and an independent uh, consultant on politics. Unfortunately, uh, one of our panel members, who is, whose name is Diana Nami, who is the director of the Iranian and Kurdish women's rights organizations, is unable to be with us today because she just had a medical surgery and her doctor has told her to take rest for about six weeks. However, Diana has been one of our excellent team members in our movement to give a voice to the minority women in the UK, and we wish that she recovers very quickly and we, would, we will hopefully have her next year. And this panel is going to be chaired by human rights activist and researcher Gina Khan. In 2005, Gina Khan spoke out against the mistreatment of women in the British Muslim community in the United Kingdom uh, to radio debates and local newspapers, and um, she recounted her own experience of being uh, uh, following a traumatic divorce and then living as a single mother in the Muslim community in Birmingham. And um, the expose that she provided was, was, so, uh, was so powerful that, I mean, it did put her life in, at risk. And she and her children had to uh, leave Birmingham because her house was attacked. Gina has now returned uh, to, now to, 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 give, to, re to give a voice to other women like her who were in her position to empower them and then uh, help them on these issues. Gina's work focuses on two main issues. First is the, the rise of pro-jihad ideologies within the Muslim communities, and the second is the status of women within those communities. And she believes that these two twin phenomena are symptomatic of some deeper problems. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to request our panel members to come onto the podium. Right, yes, yeah. so we're here to discuss Sharia law and women. And before I start, I would like to say that an uh, absolute honour for me to be sitting amongst women who, in my opinion, will go down in history as women who created change for, for women's rights, for, for human rights. And I never thought I would ever see this 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> If I can just give you a brief story. 20 years ago, I had a sister, cousin, who came to this country. And in the 70s, her husband committed polygamy. And she couldn't get a divorce, because we didn't have any Sharia courts. And today, you know, we are in a paradox here. We, there's more Sharia council and courts in Britain than you can imagine. It's just suddenly started to spread. So this conversation is very important, it has to continue, and who better than these fantastic ladies on here who are prepared to, you know, give their time and put their effort and energy and turn their life into a career to change the status of Muslim women, because it's a serious issue, as you know, it's, it's going to go on from year to year. So we will start with Mariam, as everybody knows Mariam, I don't need to give an introduction, do I? Just a sentence. Well, yeah, Mar I will say a few words about everybody, yeah. Mariam, as you know, is the spokesman of One Law for All campaign um, against Sharia law. She was actually one of the first people to give me a voice when I wanted to speak out against what was happening in the community. So thank you for that, Mariam, because I never did thank you for that. Um, she also, as you know, is on the International Advisory Board with the Raif Badawi Foundation for Freedom. Now, Mariam in Britain at the moment is the person standing up for uh, freedom of speech and expression, so I'm sure you all know very well over that. 
We also have um, Nasreen Roman here, a winning playwright and screen um, playwright. Uh, she co-founded co British Muslims for Secular Democracy, and I discovered she was also part of um, the first group in Pakistan, actually, WAF, WAF, um, a Pakistani organisation, women feminist activists who stand up, obviously, in their own country. Um, also, we've got Yasmin. Yasmin Raymond, freelance consultant and doctoral candidate at the School of Oriental and African Studies. I'm not going to go into their academics because when I read this, I was like, are you sure you really want me to be? Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, Yasmin has worked for local government. She has worked for um, against violence with women, race, gender, all the issues. We all sort of share the... Um, similarities there on the issues that we all stand up against. And we also have um, Pragna Patel. Hi, Pragna. Hi. We all know Pragna. I'm sure we know Pragna. I knew Pragna even before she knew me. But anyway, um, and as you know, she's founder and director of South All Sisters, um, Women Against Fundamental uh, Fundamentalism. And um, also... You've written a book here, sorry, no, you've written extensively on race, gender, religion, citizenship, whose rights, faith, so you've written a lot as well, sorry, I didn't know that, but anyway. We also have um, Gita Segal, is it Gita Segal? So, so, so I saying that right? Yeah. So, Segal. Writer, journalist, filmmaker, rights activist, you know, um, once again, the founder and director of Centre for Secular Space. I mean, these are women who have, like, hundreds of degrees. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and it's fantastic that we are here to actually listen to what they have to say about Sharia law and women's rights in the context of Britain, though, because we, we, we are going to stick to what we're going to say in Britain. So, Mariam, do you want to yeah, take sure. that off? And we have got Elham joining us again because we felt it was important. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming today. I uh, haven't prepared a lot because I thought I've got all these brilliant women next to me. We had Elham earlier, so I kind of feel like I can say nothing and I'll still look good. You know, so I'm just so relaxed today. I even had a drink for lunch, which is great. Uh, so I, I thought, and, and you know, uh, we're gonna have lots of discussions and we're gonna hear um, different aspects of this issue. But I wanted to just, in my short time, focus on some basic things, which is one, one, one important aspect of it is the One Law for All campaign. And it was a campaign that started in 2008, December 2008, a campaign where not many people were willing to work with us when we first started. Uh, and you, you can't blame people because of the xenophobia and the racism that exists in society and the fact that people are so careful um, not to offend, which is not really a bad thing when you think about it. It's just, you know, people are trying to be civil, people are trying to be nice, but then it is problematic when you're trying to defend women's rights, when you're trying to defend equality, and when you're trying to stand up to a vicious movement like the Islamists, mm -hmm. who are killing uh, many of our people back home, as well as uh, threatening people uh, also in Europe, and of course now even killing people in Europe. So it is a, a, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate situation that we've all come up with. And today though, I think there's a lot more people willing to work with us, and uh, we now have a wonderful group of organizations, many of whom are sitting right here. I think it's also important to mention the National Secular Society, and others who've been campaigning with us for you know, the, an end to any sort of parallel legal system, whether it's Sharia courts, whether it's the Beftin. Uh, and this whole idea of universalism and citizenship rights, irrespective of one's background and one's beliefs. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, what we're seeing is that the British government, we've talked about it earlier, has privatized uh, the law in many instances has privatized schooling and education and these sort of homogenized communities have been segregated and divided and kept unequal 
via courts and schools and even public policy and services. So we're seeing this constant segregation that Elham talked about earlier. And it, it's been an uphill battle to fight against this and to demand you know, that women and men, irrespective of their beliefs and backgrounds, be seen first and foremost as human beings and as citizens. It seems such a simple concept but it is really impossible to get the government to acknowledge this very basic fact. And so I'm really proud and happy to be amongst these wonderful women. Honestly, it makes me emotional uh, because, I've, uh, because it's been a hard battle to get us all to work together, to find each other, because that's the other thing. We all have been working in various fields for many decades. Um, and some, some of us started, I started working, I mean, I came to Britain in 2000. So I didn't know a lot of the brilliant work that was already done that actually made it easier for me to do my work, but I didn't even know who had paved the way for me. And so it's really great that we are working together, that we've come together. And I think this is a really positive thing. And I think we're going to win because of it, because we have the, these, these wonderful people and groups working together. And we've already met, met some great successes. You know, we were able to gather uh, our organizations together um, ensure that Universities UK, which had endorsed gender segregation at universities, uh, we had managed to push that back and, and force them to withdraw. And you know, they were um, making it seem as if gender segregation is something, well, you know, people out of choice want to sit separately and they have a right to do that. And we were pushing this argument that it's like racial segregation you wouldn't find it acceptable. Why do you find it acceptable when it comes to women? Whenever it comes to women, anything and everything always seems to be acceptable. And the other great success that we've had is against the Law Society, which had tried to incorporate Sharia in Wales. And of course, we know, we've heard from some of the things Elham said today as well, where women get half of what men do. And even, I mean, the Law Society, imagine, was, was saying things like, well, if the child is illegitimate, they don't have a right to any uh, inheritance. Uh, if they're non-Muslim, they don't have a right to inheritance. This is the Law Society speaking as if this is a matter of fact. And again, they were forced to withdraw and apologize. They apologize. So it is possible to push back the Islamists. It is possible to win and to do it from an anti-racist and a human rights and a woman's rights perspective. And that's what we're doing. And that's something I think we should all be proud of because we have all, each and every one of you as well who's sitting here today, has been part of that. On December 10th, we hand delivered a letter to, the, to Downing Street. We were all there. Um, most of us were there. And um, 400 uh, groups and individuals signed on to this statement. We handed it into Downing Street. Uh, two months later, we got a letter from Lord Ahmad on behalf of the Prime Minister. He is the Home Office Minister for Countering Extremism. And of course, he gave the usual government line, which is, I mean, if I'm being nice, is, is dishonest. Let, let's be plain. It is dis dishonest because his main point in the letter, which is the government's position, is that this is not a parallel legal system. Well, I'm sorry you're lying if you think that. I think Elham very clearly showed that it is a parallel legal system. The courts themselves say they are parallel legal systems because they call the some cor courts. Those who are uh, sitting and judging on the lives of countless human beings call themselves judges. So don't tell us that it's not a parallel legal system. Also, in addition to the Sharia councils, which are charities, by the way, if you know, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain was refused charitable status because we're too political and because we defend secularism. But if you run a Sharia court and you push the Islamist line and you promote misogyny every day, well, of course, welcome to the Charity Commission. You, you, you can get charitable status. And that's a whole other issue that we'll, we'll need to look into. But we also have the Muslim arbitration tribunals, which are using the Arbitration Act. So do not please tell us that there is no such thing as a paralegal system in this country. And also please do not tell us, as, as they did in the letter, that you know, there's just a little concern about some courts being discriminatory against women. Well, I mean, if the law is discriminatory, it is not about some courts, it is about all of them. Yeah. If you go to 
a situation, if you go and visit South Africa during racial apartheid, are you really going to go and see which of the courts were racist against black people and brown people and Asians? Well, if the law is fundamentally unjust, it is going to be detrimental for anyone. You don't really need that much evidence, though there's ample evidence to show the discriminatory nature of these courts and its consequences, as Elham says, its consequences on real live human beings. So I think you know, the fact that there isn't a parallel legal system, we know there is. The Muslim Arbitration Tribunal is using the Arbitration Act. And we know that it's, it's not even supposed to be using the Arbitration Act because to go to an arbitration court, you must be on equal footing. We know under Sharia, a woman's testimony is worth half a man's. It has to be voluntary. We know that in many situations, it isn't voluntary. So we know for a fact that this is not working out, and nonetheless, the government turns a blind, blind eye because it likes to have its minorities managed for it on its behalf by regressive Islamist organizations. It's, it's, it's the outsourcing the law on the cheap and damned be all those whose rights are being violated, violated day in and day out. Now, just to give you an example of the Muslim Arbitration Tribunal, which is using, how much time which is using um, the Arbitration Act, you've got the um, person who started the whole thing, Sheikh Faizal Akhtab Siddiqui. And I always find it interesting, uh, we've got a TV program that's broadcast in Iran, where we talk about insane fatwas every week. And it, it, there's this amazing correlation between really long names and really like hideous <laughs> judgments and decisions. Uh, I'm sure there's some sort of academic, I can back this up if someone helps me. <laughs> so, anyway, he started the Muslim Arbitration Tribunals and for example, he's seen cases, uh, domestic violence cases, where the women have been forced to drop their charges with the police, and the men have been sent to anger management courses with the local imam. I don't think so. So th this is what we're talking about, using the Arbitration Act. And of course, he has the wonderful, um, you know, whatever, the, the wonderful, I can't think of the world, but he has, he is the one who led a protest against Charlie Hebdo a month after 11 people were slaughtered. Okay, so this is the person who runs, he's a barrister, who runs the MATs. So please don't tell me that this has not, this, you know, there's a few of them only, and it's not a parallel legal system. So yes, it is a woman's rights issue, of course. It's about parallel legal systems. But also, I think importantly, uh, something that Elham talked about is that it's very much linked to the Islamist movement. We did not have Sharia courts in this country until 1982 since the rise of Islamism after the Iranian revolution was expropriated by the Islamist movement. And as um, Nasreen also talked about in Pakistan, in Iran, in Afghanistan, in many of our countries, we did not have uh, these sort of Islamic courts and Islamism to the extent that we have today. It's important to see these courts within that context. If you do not see these courts within that context, you will fail to be able to see that this is an Islamist project an Islamist project that is there to violate women's rights, free expression, human rights, and on and on. And we have seen it in our own countries, in Iran. The first thing they do, they targeted women. And that's what they're doing here with their family code. As Gita said, oh, so they're targeting women, so it's inconsequential from the point of the government and from the point of many others. Um, I just want to... Uh, and by quoting Maria Mahela Lucas, an Algerian uh, sociologist. She has said that there are many people on the left who are siding with the Islamists. And they do this without acknowledging the fact that there is a political fight taking place. A fight fr from us against them, against the Islamists. And they're taking the side of the Islamists under the guise that they are protecting some sort of patronizing defense of minority rights, in this fight they are siding with the Islamists, as is, as is the British government. And so we're saying that we're not going to back down until we address this issue. This is a woman's rights issue. This is a human rights issue. 
And also, fundamentally, this is part of this fight against Islamism. You want to stop terrorism, but allow for violations of women's rights. It doesn't work that way. Terrorism is the military wing of this movement. Sharia courts are part of its political wing. We need to stop them both, but we need to also stand up unequivocally against xenophobia and racism. There's no place for that. This is not a fight between East and West. There are many people in the East who have more bravery and more courage in fighting Islamism than anyone in the West does. And we need to stand with them. We need to stand with Muslims, ex-Muslims, and everyone who is standing up for women's rights and equality. No ifs and buts. Enough really has to be enough. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant, that was wonderful. That's why, um, you know, it said six, seven minutes each speaker, but that's not going to be possible because I think these ladies have got something absolutely incredible, wonderful to tell us. Um, and, and we need to acknowledge it and we need to listen. So I will give some extra time. And I think the next person is going to speak. Now, is you, Yasmin? It's Nasreen. Yes. Is, is it not you, Nasreen? Oh, no. Nasreen, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'd like to begin first by saying thank you, Mariam, for, and your team for making this possible. And thank you, Adam, for a very illuminating and a very important uh, presentation, I think, which is going to be a toolkit for so many of us. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to add that it's an absolute privilege for me to share the platform with Gita, with Pragna, with Yasmin, uh, Gina, and of course, Mariam, because it has been a long fight, and I think it's going to get longer and harder. So, uh, a little bit about, very quickly, about British Muslims for Secular Democracy and myself. Uh, the idea of BMST came to me because, some years ago, I think, uh, rooted in the whole debate about who was a Muslim and who had the right to be a Muslim or speak for Muslims when the satanic verses crisis suddenly erupted on the scene. And BMST didn't <coughs> actually get incorporated till 2006. And I think that a lot of us at BMST, we don't all hold the same views, but I certainly feel that Islamophobia and obscurantist interpretations of Islam are two sides of the same coin. They actually feed each other. So, but now I'll t take the focus, of course, to England and the debate about one law for all. So who would disagree that government, parliament, and the courts have a duty to protect the rights and prevent the exploitation of the most vulnerable members of our society? But all too often we find that they abrogate this responsibility, as Mariam has already told us, by condoning parallel systems of justice that promote cruel and discriminatory practices perpetuated by obscurantists and fanatics in many faith communities. This is not just limited to Muslims. Often falsely pleading divine sanction as a smokescreen for cruelty, patriarchy, the only way to ensure equality and justice is to stand together for clarity and one law for all. This does not mean that we do not accept religious, cultural and ethnic diversity. Rather, we raise our voices against injustices perpetuated in the guise of faith or culture. And we want to hold the government accountable. In January 2008, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, spoke of the unavoidable introduction of some aspects of Sharia law in Britain. The media, too, has focused its lens on religious courts in the UK, particularly their role within minority communities in a religiously and culturally diverse society. So how do we celebrate and accept difference and ensure equality? The freedom and right to consult a religious body rather than a court of law in civil disputes and personal matters 
challenges the balance between two fundamental principles of contemporary British society, equality before the law versus personal liberty. How does society balance the right to individual freedom in the private sphere if it's in conflict with collective values and the law of the land, such as equality for women and freedom from all forms of discrimination? I'll just here very quickly like to rehearse a bit of the law. Now, the European Convention on Human Rights, which becomes effective in the UK from 1973, I'll read it very quickly just to remind us. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change a person's religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in pri public or private to manifest her religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice and observance. I have inserted her where the act in its rather patriarchal mode of expression denotes the individual as he. Freedom to manifest one's religion of beliefs shall be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society in the interests of public safety, for the protection of public order, health or morals, very blurred areas, or for the protection of the rights and the freedoms of others. Now, the Human Rights mm -hmm. Act 1998 repeating the protocol number seven from the European Convention, also says, uh, I'll actually compress this, that Article 5, which is, I think, relevant to the discussions that we've been having, equality between spouses, and I think many people would find this quite comic, equality between spouses Spouses shall enjoy equality of rights and responsibilities of a private law character between them and in their relations with their children as to marriage, during marriage, and in the event of its dissolution. So this actually presents a rather comic scenario uh, of the conflict. And again, uh, if we look at the Equality Act under Part 2, uh, Advancement of Equality, Chapter 1, Public Sector Equality Duty, 1497, Age, Disability, Gender, Reassignment, Gender Reassignment, Pregnancy and Maternity, Race, Religion or Belief, Sex and Sexual Orientation are included. Now this is very important for us to understand because often this forms the bedrock of what many of the Sharia councils and the Beth Deans, etc., stand on. This is what they're leaning on. So how do we solve this conundrum of liberty on the one hand, freedom of expression on the other hand, and freedom of expression being used to do exactly the opposite? Now, there's also considerable confusion over the legal status and remit of the religious and legal functions of the Batai Deen, the plural of Beth Deen, and Sharia councils, and the plurality of Jewish and Islamic law in the UK. As Alham has already told us, religious law is hugely contested, and there's no agreement about it. So if a layperson goes to a religious forum for arbitration or advice, what advice are they going to get? So there needs to be more public scrutiny and examination of how these parallel areas of justice work within UK law to offer arbitration in civil disputes. Some questions that we should ask or foreground, I think, are, are decisions of Sharia councils and Beth Deen voluntarily entered into, and are they legally binding? We know that they're not but we need to foreground this much more. Decisions made within the parameters of the Arbitration Act 1996 are legally binding, subject to the approval of civil courts. Now, both parties must freely agree to accept the judgment as legally binding by signing an arbitration agreement with the concerned Beth Dean or Sharia Council. Now, as you see, 
the law is, the law of the land is facilitating the parallel system of justice. It's, it's not actually putting a spanner in the works, it's actually facilitating it. So, however, they say that civil courts retain the right to intervene in any case where the award of the best dean or Sharia council is considered unreasonable or contrary to UK law. And as we heard earlier, that whole system of religious interpretation, etc., and religious freedom in the law in the European Convention and the Human Rights Act is blurred and fuzzy at best. Now, today's focus has been really on Sharia law, and I think it's highly contested, and there is a lack of clarity, but we should also look at, for instance, Jewish marriages conducted in synagogues in the UK, which are registered with the state. Religious and civil divorces, however, are separate procedures. A religious divorce is not an alternative to a civil divorce. It does not alter an individual's legal status, just as a civil divorce does not dissolve a religious marriage. A Jewish couple, from what I understand, seeking a religious divorce must both freely agree to obtain a Jewish contractual divorce document known as a get from a Beth team which acts as a witness. My understanding is that under some interpretations of Jewish law, a get may only be granted if both parties agree. Unsatisfactory divorces where one party refuses divorce can present practical problems for the continuation of the other party's Jewish life especially for women. Men suffer limited social opprobrium by not being divorced, while a woman can be seriously disadvantaged. If she remarries in the civil courts without a get, she will be regarded as being adulterous, and any future child of hers will be considered a mamsa or illegitimate in Jewish law. As a result, men have a limited incentive to grant their wives a divorce. Among Muslim and Jewish communities in the UK, decisions of Beth deans and increasingly Sharia courts are often seen as religiously and morally binding. Some members of the Jewish and Muslim communities seek a religious divorce, for example, because they feel it is necessary to maintain a sense of honor within their community. And we also know increasingly of all the damage both physical violence and mental torture that happens in the name of honor in families and communities. I should also quickly now turn to guidance from Sikh councils on, for example, interfaith marriage. So if a person who is a Sikh wants to enter into a marriage with a non-Sikh, I went to uh, the, Sikh, uh, the Sikh council's guidance. Now, According to them, the guidelines have been developed through a comprehensive consultation which took place over a two-year period. Now, it's very interesting what they say is that their advice is that if a Sikh wants to marry a non-Sikh, they should go to the Gurdwara Management Committee and the Management Committee will ensure that both parties have awareness of the following basic Sikh tenets. Belief in only one God, teachings from the Gurus, particularly Guru Nanak and Guru Gobind Singh, etc., etc., and it also includes not to pay homage to or worship any other deity or person. So basically, um, you either have to convert to Sikhism or you can't get married in the Guru Dwara. Now, I know that we've been focusing mainly on marriage uh, and divorce, but just recently there's been a case that's been reported, and it is about a girl who's an Adivasi Christian, Permela Turki, who was working 18 hours a day with a family who considered her to be of a lower caste and 
a slave, virtually. She was working 18 hours a day. Now, in the judgment, in fact, the judgment has been the first caste discrimination case in the UK. And indeed, what is very interesting is that whereas K a Caste Watch UK reports caste discrimination, both the Hindu Forum and the Hindu Council uh, of Britain, they actually say that caste discrimination does not happen in the UK. So uh, I think it's, uh, I've given these different examples actually to support the argument for one law for all, because there are too many systems of law out there for all manner of everyday life aspects. And we cannot allow this to happen. The government cannot allow this to happen because they're abrogating their responsibility. And it's extremely, extremely important that if we look at the Islamic law of evidence, of inheritance, we've seen the lacuna that come over there. Mariam has talked about the will, uh, that the, the guidance for wills that was being promoted by none other than the law society. So, I mean, we really have to look at where the trajectories of these mud, completely muddled up legal systems is coming from, from the government, the state, the parliament, the lawmakers are letting us down. And the only byword is equality. That's all. Mm -hmm. We should not settle for anything less. So I told you you would need more than 10 minutes. <laughs> and now we move on to Yasmin. Roman. I'm going to stand over there because I Okay, you want to start? Yeah, I'm going to stand. Thank you. We're talking today a lot about Sharia councils and Beth Dins and various other um, religious, formal religious structures. I just want to remind you to, to remember, well, I just want you to remember that there are legal firms within this country that now have Islamic divisions. Russell Jones and Walker is probably the biggest. Aina Khan, who's a, who's a solicitor, is probably the most well-known. So we're not just up against these, these councils that are there. We are also up against some of the biggest legal firms who do some fantastic work in other arenas, but have been, I don't know whether they've been advised or, or they're chasing the brown pound. I, I'd hate to cast dispersions on lawyers. Um, but I do have a real issue with it, and I think whilst we're, whilst we're tackling Sharia councils and Sharia courts, that we, we need to be thinking um, about this. It's called polygamy the too difficult, in the too difficult box. I stand on the shoulders of all the work around forced marriage and honour-based violence that I've worked on for decades alongside Gita, alongside Pragna, and I'm really thrilled that those bits of work have, have received some traction, that we have legislation, whether it's civil or criminal, that they're in public. I don't understand why polygamy isn't given the attention that it deserves. Mm. We've had the death of Sahad Dafari in 2008, um, a young Afghan Muslim woman who entered into a marriage. She's a beautiful young woman, a model. I've met her family um, who... Um, she married this man, uh, Rashid Jamil, didn't realise that he, that he was already married. She found out that he was, um, huge issues in the relationship, and she killed herself. It was covered by some of the newspapers, but it never attracted that level of media attention that um, Benaz Mahmood, Heshi Yonis, and others have attracted. And I'm not in any way suggesting hierarchy. What I'm saying is every young woman deserves attention. All of the deaths, all of the domestic violence homicides that are reported every single week deserve your attention. Two women a week, two women a week in this country die. So I think polygamy is the too difficult box. Um, that just says what the different forms of multiple marriage are. I'm not going to talk about the other stuff. This is about men who marry more than one woman. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, Mormons. We have Mormons in this country. Obviously, Muslims. Um, the delightful Jacob Zuma. 
president of South Africa, who, who came to this country with two of his wives, was entertained at Buckingham Palace with, I can't remember if it was the third one or the fifth one, but anyway. Then we have Cody Brown. We've got a real, there's a real movement in the States around trying to present multiple men in, who have multiple wives as the family next door. There are soap operas, Big Love, about the Hendricksons, which is all pitched around this poor man, Bill Hendrickson, who really struggles with his three wives and all of his children, one who wants to leave the Mormon church, the others who, who want to stay in it. Um, but it's all pitched from Bill's point of view and the challenges that he faces. Cody Brown, um, it's one of those... Um, reality TV junky things. They've also got Sistar Wives, which is a, um, the black version, because um, black people are now okay in the Mormon church. That happened in about 78, I think. Um, so it's not just about Islam. It's also not a new issue. If you look back mm. to the judgment in 18... I've <coughs> put my glasses on, sorry. 1866, Hyde v. Hyde and Woodmansey, which actually... You know, where, um, Lord Penda Penzance actually framed, set, gave us the common law definition of marriage when he said, I conceive that marriage as understood in Christendom may for this purpose be defined as a voluntary union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. There's been lots written about this and I haven't got the time to go into it, but this was about a, Mor a Mormon marriage. So John Hyde his, um, had left the Mormon church his wife had um, entered into, um, become a second wife for someone else from Woodman Sea, and John Hyde was seeking a divorce, and he came to the UK to seek it under English law. So it's not a new issue. There have been cases in this country that I've looked at going back to the 1950s. The Hindu community, the Sikh community, um, I have spoken to, I've, I've undertaken 50 interviews with men and women, who are in polygamous unions, um, and adult children. I can't see the benefit, other than to men who want to get their leg over with, with other women. I'm sorry to be so crude. This is about, to, for me, <coughs> sexual access. As a Muslim, I see no place for it in Islam. None of the reasonings make any sense to me about you know, giving women economic protections. Well, we have Zagat, we have charity. Why the hell aren't we using that? I don't, I, I don't see the reasons for it in Islam, and I don't see the reasons for it anywhere else. But the international human rights bodies have a real issue with polygamy. They don't include it in the list of harmful traditional practices. There was a huge debate around, well, if we, if we, ba if we prohibit polygamy and then say it's a harmful traditional practice, this is all in the Banda report from 2008, um, what do we do with the women and children who are in those unions? Oddly enough, we haven't had that same discussion around FGM. We never said, what do we do with the women who've already undergo undergone gender mutilation? We put in place support <coughs> services. We can put in place laws that protect those that are already in these marriages, but prohibit it going forward. But what we are doing by failing to act on this issue is condemning women and children we are, and young men, we are condemning generations to abuse and violence. I'm chucking away loads of this presentation because I think Elham has covered so much and I'm so grateful to her for the book. Um, I've been fortunate enough to read it. I didn't think I would ever see a time when this was something that was discussed openly. So I'm going to give you three quick stories from the interviews that I've done. Um, one of them was an interview I hadn't intended to do. I delivered the qualities and diversity training sometimes, and there was a young Muslim woman there who put her hand up at the end and said, oh, I want to talk to you about something about work. Could I speak to you afterwards? So we went off and had a quick chat, and I thought she was going to talk about work. Um, her opening line was, you seem normal, and I need some help. I've never been called normal. I went with this. Um, I don't know her, I'd never met her before. Her parents had introduced her to someone. Um, her father's an imam. She, her opening line was, you know, I, I don't wear hijab, I'm in Western dress, I have choices. 
But her family had introduced her to a man who had said to her, you, at the first meeting, you will not be my only wife. You must know, this is my Islamic right, you will not be my only wife. So she was asking me what she should do. This is a 24-year-old young woman who was terrified, about to make the most momentous decision of her life. Started giving me statistics about, you know, the imbalance between uh, women and men, that there are all these women in the world and they've got to find husbands and maybe polygamy is the only way through. And then when I said to her, challenged her with some of the stats that I have, she said that thing to me, Ellen, that you said. She said, I can't, I can't put my faith in the Kufra statistics. She's not the only young woman I've met. I've met young men who were saying quite openly, I will have another wife because I can. I've met a young woman whose mother was um, the first wife. When dad went off and married someone else um, because he claimed he'd been forced to marry the, his first wife, didn't want to be with her, but it was really convenient because she could look after his parents and, and give birth to two of his children. Her mother was so damaged from those relationships that she took her own life. This young woman was 17 years old. She was now responsible for two younger siblings. It's what Ellen said, this is about context, this is about the reality of people's lives, and I haven't even got to the worst bit yet. And I'm, I always feel like whenever I speak at any of these things, I end up being the voice of doom. In 2011, I received an email from, um, because I, I, I kind of, I get on these Muslim matrimonial websites. I'm, not, I'm married, by the way, I'm not looking for anyone. Um, <laughs> Although, you know, George Clooney, if he was available. But, um, <laughs> so, I you know, to try and sort of gather information and, and as part of my research. And I was sent an email by an organisation called Halal Wives, who are connected to another organisation called the Obedient Wives Club. The Obedient Wives Club come out of Malaysia, where there is fantastic work done around polygamy by sisters in Islam. And what they were offering to British men was the opportunity to marry women in refugee camps. There's an article in today's Guardian about sex slavery and Syrian women. If you haven't seen it, please look at it. So I called the number. There was a number. I could speak to someone called brother, whatever. Um, trying to dig some information. They were specifically looking for widowed or divorced men. Um, who were, I was trying to sort of tout my brother as a possibility to try and get some more information. Um, and the language that was used was shocking. It was around, along the lines of, you'll be doing your Islamic duty. We do not want you to bring these women to the UK. You don't have to do that, but you have to send money. You send money to them every month. This money will no doubt go straight to the coffers of, of the jihadists. God knows what will happen to the women. They were open about the fact that these women had been not just victims of war and were traumatised, but possibly also victims of rape. But the killer line, the killer line was, these are not your image of a Syrian beauty. These are women who have been ravaged by war. It's not what I expected when I started doing this research in 2009. I don't care if it's a religious practice. This is abuse. It's a child protection issue. It's the protection of women. It's the protection of men. Because I wonder about some of the men who are vulnerable, who will be handing money over fist, who may go to, to Turkey, to Syria, to work one of these refugee camps, not linked to extremism at all, but on the basis of some religious duty or possibly sexual urges, I don't know, um, end up caught up in, in either the fighting over there or being picked up by the counter-terrorism police. That's another life destroyed. This is such a mess. And our government, I don't know why the media's not interested in it. Our governments aren't interested in it. I try to raise it at various platforms 
And as always, Mariam is the only person who gives me a platform to speak about polygamy. I've not had this platform anywhere else. This is about all of us. This is about all of us. They are permeating, the Islamists are permeating <coughs> every bit of our lives and they care for no one. So I'm asking you today for your help to raise this issue. I've got six years of work. I'm going to try and get it published. But get it on those platforms. Every opportunity you get, if you do work around child protection, I will come, I do not charge. I will come and I will speak about it. There are children dying in this country, there are women dying in this country because of these practices. And there are no protections. The British legal system doesn't, if the re marriage isn't registered, it's not recognised, so there is no way of going to the English courts. And the Sharia councils will not protect these women. So, call to action to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Yasmin. Because actually that is true it's, when it comes to polygamy. I haven't heard a lot of platforms on that either or a lot of conferences. Or, or, so thank you for that. Um, you all right if you take a few questions? We will do. I'm just going to give ten or more just to the rest. There's only um, Pragna and Gita left and then we'll have a question and answering well, we, session. We'll forget uh, what was said. Well, take we'll notes like the rest of them. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Oh, we've got some notes, don't we? Anyway, Pragna is going to speak now, so if you want to go ahead, Pragna. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, um, of course, um, for inviting me, Marion, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here with friends and comrades and, um, and to talk about uh, legal pluralism and the wider question of access to justice, because I think that's what we're talking about. Um, much of what needs to be said, really, about not just Sharia, but religious laws, religious authority, legal pluralism, has already been quite powerfully and eloquently said by many of the speakers, and particularly by uh, the wonderful presentation by Ellen right at the beginning. So I, I am going to talk a little bit about the impact of religious codes on, on the vulnerable women that I see at Southall Black Sisters. But I wanted to actually try and attack the question from another angle completely. Um, so I was thinking about, you know, what could I possibly say? Um, how could I link this to something momentous that's happened just this week gone? And I'm actually referring to the Hillsborough campaign um, because that campaign was about truth and justice. And it reached a high point in the week that just went by. I don't think any of us can have been failed to be, be moved by the powerful and dignified way in which the families of the 96 people who died in the Hillsborough football disaster um, had struggled for 27 years. So for state accountability, in the face of what? In the face of layers upon layers of lies, deceptions and cover-ups by the police, by health institutions, part of the judiciary, and sections of the media. And so really, you know, what was at the heart of that campaign was the uh, demand for state accountability. And I think it's now at the center of a series of questions that need to be asked of the police, social services, and all the institutions that are meant to protect the vulnerable. Um, and especially in the wake of the appalling failures that we've seen in the child sexual abuse scandals in Rotherham and elsewhere. And actually, we can go back further to the brutal policing of the miners' strike, or grieve comes to mind, and the cover-up of the racist death of Stephen Lawrence. So the rot started a long time ago in the, in the context of state um, accountability. So some of you might be thinking, well, what's that got to do with our discussions on Sharia laws today? Well, I think there are connections. 
I've been thinking a lot about the wider question of access to justice because that's the theme that connects all of this and and how we really need to frame our debates on Sharia laws, on religious laws and parallel legal systems within the context of state accountability. And I think that for two reasons, I think that that's important. One, it seems to me it's obvious that parallel, le parallel legal systems dis that, are, that discriminate, and they, and they evidently do, can only flourish in a context of institutional failures. That's what allows them to flourish. They are encouraged directly and indirectly by the state. And so we see this creeping encroachment of Sharia laws in, the, in British law and policy, not just in relation to the setting up of alternative arbitration forums, but actually creeping into the very fabric of the legal system in the way that Yasmin, for example, talked about the, 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 the really high-end commercial firms that have got their Islamic departments, but also in the way that you've seen this shariafication creeping into even legal sort of debates and uh, cases within the legal system. So it's a kind of a two-pronged attack that Islamism has mounted. But this encroachment is actually illustrative of institutional failures in the legal system, and we see that with the devastating cuts to legal aid. Um, it is also indicative of economic and political failures, including the austerity measures. And Ellen mentioned right early on, I think it was a really important point, of the retreat of the welfare state and the privatization of justice and the neoliberal objective. What all of this has done is create a democratic and ethical vacuum <coughs> at all levels of our society. We're moving towards social authoritarianism and a democratic deficit. And that's what's allowing the religious right to occupy the gap, the vacuum, the space. And it is doing so with devastating consequences, as people have outlined. And we're seeing the increasing role that the religious right is playing in education, in service delivery, in community organizations, and of course, the law itself. The other reason why the connections are there is that by locating our campaign within the framework on access to justice and state accountability, we actually have scope to develop solidarity with many other groups also campaigning for state accountability in struggles which at first glance seem not to be connected. And I think that's important, solidarity with those that are also struggling for access to justice and state accountability for two reasons. One, we get a dialogue going. What does state accountability look like and who is state accountability for? Is it just for those who die in police custody? Is it just for those who die in football stadiums because of failures on the part of the police and the health and safety uh, um, you know, um, institutions and others? Or should it also apply to women? Why are women at the bottom of the list when it comes to demands around state accountability? So I think we need to connect all this. I've actually been struck by two aspects of the Hillsborough Campaign for Justice, which I found incredibly moving. Firstly, it took 27 years. Just imagine, 27 years, never giving up that hope. Ordinary families who were fed lies, who were vilified, who were demonized. And what did they want? They wanted to get at the truth. If not quite justice, not yet, anyway. But the fact that there was an inquest and, and the inquest is the longest jury case in British legal history. Imagine that. Funded, incidentally, entirely by the Home Office, not the Legal Aid Agency. And why did the Home Office fund it? Because it wanted to make sure that there was equality of arms in the courtroom. So that the police, who have the resources and the best lawyers, are not pitted against individuals and ordinary people who have no resources 
and no legal advice and representation. Now that, I think, was something we need to take away with us. What we're talking about when we're talking about Sharia laws is equality of arms. We're talking about equality before the law, as others have said. Perhaps we can point to this and say that there needs to be the resources to enable us to obtain justice, even in the legal system itself. We can't do that if we don't have legal aid. I also think we take hope from this because despite everything, it shows that the British justice system can be made to work. Slow as it is, it can be made to work. I can imagine what it would be like in somewhere like India, where there are atrocities and catastrophes like this happening all the time, and those victims never see justice. And I think we take hope from that because despite everything, it shows that we just have to plough away and keep going and hopefully it won't take 27 years for the, for, the, for the government to listen, but we've got to carry on doing what we're doing and not give up. And as Mariam and others have said, we've already won some significant victories and certainly on legal aid cuts, we've won some interesting victories which have been really important. They're, up, they're, they're the other side of the coin of this battle. And we've um, also won victories in reversing fundamentalist demands for gender segregated seating and Sharia compliant policies in the legal system. So all is not lost. We just have to keep chipping away. The other thing that came out of the Hillsborough campaign, I think, is the dramatic shift in public discourse that appears to be taking place on policing. Following Hillsborough, and the many other shocking failures of the police, we hear the Home Secretary talk more and more about a code of ethics that has to be embedded within the police institutions. Theresa May, the Home Secretary, recently said on the matter, it's astonishing that the police have not had an explicit code of ethics, an equivalent, if you like, to the Hippocratic Oath for Doctors. I think it will prove vital for establishing and maintaining fundamental ethical standards for police officers. So let's think about this, a code of ethics. An interesting concept. The first thing that springs to mind to me is how can we use this concept to further our campaigns for holding power that's embodied both in the state and in religious institutions to account? in the face of the creeping shariification of law and policy that we're witnessing in Britain today, a development that hinders rather than enhances our struggles against religious fundamentalism and for equality before the law and for human rights. So in a context where all public institutions, including the legal system, are increasingly imbued with regressive identity politics rather than the principles of human rights and equality, how can we apply, um, give, uh, how can we ask for rigorous application of ethical standards? Can the concept help us in our demands for state accountability? Demands that institutions respect the rights and dignity of each and every person with which they engage. That's at the heart of it. And, and there's a wider question that remains. What should those ethical standards look like? Can we even talk of ethical standards if they are not underpinned by human rights values? Values that are capable of being enforced by ordinary people through the availability of legal aid and through recourse to the Human Rights Act. Surely a code of ethics means that all public institutions must obey and respect the rule of law, act with integrity at all times, and not abuse their positions of power. Yet the irony of the Home Secretary's statement on a code of ethics is not lost, on me at least. Mm -hmm. This is the same government that's mounted a savage assault on the legal aid system in a bid to dismantle it. And it is the same government that is trying to pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights. Yeah, st arguing um, and following the government's election pledge to repeal the Human Rights Act. So 
something that actually that South for Black Sisters and others are gearing up to challenge as soon as the European referendum is over, because that's the next battle. They are seeking to repeal the Human Rights Act. So here, all of us talking about human rights, talking about applying those standards, cannot make sense if we don't actually defend the fact that they are about to repeal the Human Rights Act and the standards and values that underpin it. So these discussions, I think, are really relevant to our own discussion here today. Turning to the question of Sharia laws and legal pluralism in particular, our experience at Southall Black Sisters show that a key goal of the religious right is, of course, to regulate the family and gender relations. That is the, key, that is the main th um, objective. And they want to do that without any form of state interference and intervention. And clearly, it's not surprising that the family is the most closely governed is site, most closely governed by religious personal laws, mainly because of the centrality that is given to women's role in the reproduction, socialization, and preservation of, ent of identity within <coughs> the family, which rests on the patriarchal control of women's minds and bodies. But the power of religion as a separate source of non-state power to regulate, shape, and ultimately deny women's rights in relation to marriage, sexuality, reproductive rights, divorce, and other decision-making in the family has been recognized by vulnerable women that we see. In fact, they are acutely aware of the political and patriarchal dimensions of religious authority, and they only understand only too well that if they don't challenge religious authority, their dreams and hopes and aspirations to live as equals in their communities and in the wider society will be stifled. So if there's one theme that runs through their stories um, in, in terms of their engagement with religious codes, religious authorities and religious forums, is that the, there is an assault that is taking place on their rights and dignity. And they're actually alert to the wider dangers of not keeping the law and religion separate. I think it's Karima Benoun who said that the struggle to keep the law and religion separate is one of the most urgent struggles that's going on. Certainly we're facing that here, but it's a struggle that's going on worldwide. So here's some examples of what women say about religious authority that they in their daily lives. One woman said, doesn't make a difference if these are men or women trustees. They feel superior to devotees. I don't know why they have to feel so superior. It is the public that gives them their status. The politics of these places is very dirty, very corrupt. That's the word, corruption. If anyone rebels against their ideas, they would be against that person. They never encourage women to divorce until it happens to their own daughter. Another woman said, I would like my views represented by women, not by community and religious leaders. What would others know about women's issues? We are struggling to fit into this country and community. If religious leaders bring their laws, where can we run to? There will be more suicides, depression, castaways, conversions. It would be the biggest disaster. Another woman said, I would never go to a temple or gurdwara for help. I wouldn't feel happy about talking about myself. I feel they would judge me. I couldn't trust them to keep things confidential. I come to SBS to share my innermost feelings. I would never have been anywhere else. I couldn't go to a gurdwara or temple or masjid. I would rather die than go there. Here's another woman's quote. There is no need for religious laws. Because if you look at the Hindu religion, we had things like sati, that's the immolation of widows. Everyone has a right to live. Hindu religion will never treat women equally. Hinduism says that a woman is like a god and not to answer back. Not right. Everyone should be treated equally in law. Here's another woman. I'll be honest with you as a Muslim, someone who believes in the purity of this faith, I don't like Sharia councils. I don't think they should exist. They are for men. That's it. It's predominantly men on those councils. 
So four or five men are going to sit around a table and decide whether I can file for this or not, when God has already given me the permission to do it. And the last quote, to be honest with you, the experiences I've had with these Mulanas and Masjids telling me to be patient with abuse and violence. And I was saying, these Sharia councils are set up by men for men. That's how I see it. And as for mediation, I said it's past mediation. I don't want mediation or anything to do with them, him or his family, and he has no right to his children. The courts have already decided that he has no access to the children. And my daughter's turned 18 and she took out an injunction against him. And my other children can when they turn 18 as adults. And they'll do it to protect themselves because they've seen what kind of a monster we lived with and they were on the receiving end of it. So clearly these experiences show that the space to manifest religion has grown. But the secular space that women and sexual and religious minorities amongst others need to be free from oppressive religious imposition and constraints is shrinking daily. On a daily basis, we see the impact that the rise of the religious right has on, amongst other things, the right to life, the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, the right to choice in marriage, the right to private life, the right to freedom of expression, the right to an education, and the right to a fair trial. The bottom line for me is that all forms of religious authority and arbitration seek to remove women from the protection of the rule of law. And the state is complicit in this objective. And this is nowhere more clearly illustrated than in the reply given to one abused woman who turned to an imam for advice. You will receive justice in the afterlife. You must be patient. This is why we must resist the demands for their regulation. Often people say all we need is to tinker with these forums and just regulate them. No, we say no, no, no. It appears reasonable, but we cannot tweak profoundly unequal structures at the edges because their very nature is to avoid accountability. That's the point of them. So in conclusion, the forces of the religious right, state neoliberalism, both these forces seek to mount an assault on secular human rights value. Why? To pursue power without accountability. But they can be defeated, as our history in challenging both has shown. If we are to keep alive the voices of women, the vulnerable women that I see, as well as those of the dispossessed, we need to stop the government from taking us backwards with its kowtowing approach to the religious right and its slash and burn approach to the legal aid system, which should be as precious to us as the NHS. We need to connect what may on the surface be, be, appear to be widely differing struggles for legal aid and for the separation of religion and the law. They are in reality interlinked like conjoined twins. They form part of a wider progressive struggle for access to justice and for human rights. But perhaps above all, we need to connect with the urgent struggles for state accountability that are now taking place here and elsewhere. At the very least, we need to show solidarity by supporting these important movements like the Hillsborough Campaign because it's only by doing that that we can reset our moral ethical compass so that the needle points firmly towards a circular democracy that is still to come. Thank you. Ten minutes now, sorry, I'm only joking. <laughs> that was wonderful, thank you very much. Um, yes, we will move on to Geetha now, please. Who would like to talk a bit about the one law? Um, I think um, at this point, well, it's very hard act to follow all these good women on this panel um, and Ella this morning. Um, I cannot say how grateful I am for 
and I've done, done this book, and I'm really sorry that it's not out yet, and we're not all buying a copy, but you have to book a copy and buy one and keep it and spread the word and make sure that it is widely read. Because this is not the issue of Sharia law and other parallel legal systems. It's not new. You know, some of you may be wondering why we're sitting here slagging off a government which is actually talking about fundamentalism in some form or other the whole time without naming it. They call it extremism or non-violent extremism or violent extremism. They talk about terrorism. And they have actually said, and that's the context in which we handed uh, in a petition about it um, that Mariam talked about at the beginning. Um, they, they said that they're going to have an inquiry into Sharia councils. So uh, what's our beef, basically? And you've been hearing from the panel what our problem is, which is that the government is not consistent in what it's saying. It's not consistent. It is talking about having an inquiry, but then it has said nothing about it uh, and, and what its terms of reference are going to be and how it's going to organize it. Um, it is confined it only to Sharia councils when we know that there are other parallel systems in the country. Um, and the government has ruled out looking at that. And there are other um, movements that pressurize the government on Sharia, but only on Sharia, don't want to look at the Christian right, don't want to look at evangelicals, don't want to look at Jewish organizations don't want to look at the Hindu right, which is very active in this country. Um, and so we are resetting the framing of debates that are out there in public, that we are not coming from the same place. And so when we talked to the government and said, look, we welcome the inquiry, but we also, as Pragna has said very eloquently, that this, the, the inquiry into parallel legal systems it, well, it has to be wider than Sharia into all parallel legal systems. And it has to also, um, you know, don't take away our weapons. Don't take away the Human Rights Act and legal aid. Because actually, this fight, in the end, however long it's going to take, whether it takes five years, 10 years, or 50, it's going to be won by people like us, people like you sitting here in this room, getting together in order to challenge the state and the non-state bodies that are doing these things. Because as we've been telling you, the victories that we've won were not won by the government. In spite of the fact that it has huge counter-terrorism programs, prevent programs and so on, and has spent enormous amounts of money and effort looking at these things, it is not working on these issues. And in fact, what many of those programs are doing are seeing Sharia councils and fundamentalist leaders as part of their partners in stabilizing the communities and in keeping Britain safe from terrorism. This is what we're facing. In spite of the fact that this government says that it's against all forms of extremism, it is playing the same politics that have traditionally been played by Labour. And they only weren't play they were played by the Tories as well. It's just that the, the, the Tories had no virtually no black votes, no Asian votes, no Afro-Caribbean votes, and they didn't rule the town halls in the areas where this was going on. But the kinds of policies that Labour played have also been played by the Tories. We've seen this in the mayoral uh, 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 contest where Sadiq Khan was accused of extremism for being on a platform with some imam who's a very unpleasant character. But it turns out that the imam is also is a Tory supporter <laughs> who's been on platforms with loads of Tories who probably argued with him less than Sadiq Khan has argued with him. So, you know, there's a very, a very unpleasant communal, what we call communal in the South Asian sense, of a politics based on community, religious and sometimes ethnic or uh, caste communities that's being played out. And again, the Tories have run a viciously communal campaign that is attacking Labour for not being friendly enough with Narendra Modi. Now, Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister of India. He is from a far-right Hindu fundamentalist political party that, that, that won the election, which is a very frightening thing that has happened in a democratic country and a country which is a secular country. And all his life, he has been part of a movement uh, in which he cut his teeth, uh, a, a, a far-right Hindu nationalist movement uh, who 
whose ancestor was responsible for killing Gandhi. And since his party came to power, there have been demands that Gandhi's assassin be venerated in statues and temples and so on, because they see Gandhi as the man who destroyed India and his assassin as the man who was trying to rescue India. So let's be really, really clear that this issue is not only an issue of what's sometimes called the regressive left. The left has certainly got into bed with religious fundamentalists in this country, but so too has the right. You know, we, the problem we have goes right across the political spectrum. And we also have people in every political party who understand some of these points, some of these issues around legal aid and the Human Rights Act, even among the Tories, there are lawyers who are saying you can't just abolish international law and legal protections. Um, and there are people in uh, Labour or the Greens or other parties that do understand some of this stuff. But there are also people who are supporting the religious right in its various forms. Now, why is the religious right so powerful? One of, some of the reasons were talked about earlier in the day to do with Cold War politics and so on. With, um, Nazreen raised it and Elam raised it. But even in this era, uh, during the war on terror, the governments of the West, if we can talk about that, have not moved away from using the religious right, including the Muslim religious right, the jamaat e islami and the Muslim Brotherhood and so on, as their allies in pacifying various countries and keeping control and hoping to contain the terrorism of Al-Qaeda or ISIS and so on. And now with ISIS on the scene, they're looking at parts of Al-Qaeda to see where they can find the moderate parts of Al-Qaeda in order to use them in the fight. So they, it, this is a zero-sum game. You're always going to be moving to the right because there's always going to be some other right-wing horror and they're going to be moving further and further to the right. So, and as part, not necessarily immediately part of these policies, but, as, but also related to them, has been the issue of um, withdrawing, along with withdrawing from other kinds of social welfare, health and so on, and, and private, general privatization policies, there's been a withdrawal and an encouragement through aid programs of withdrawing the state from the law and, and encouraging cheaper forms, what they call, uh, under such titles as access to justice for the poor and so on. It's a, it's a bit like those apartheid titles, which were about, uh, I've forgotten, Bantistans. but you know. They, they, well, uh, they had all sorts of you know, good titles about, um, uh, that sounded as if they were very nice, but they were actually meaning completely the opposite. So under access to justice for, for the poor, there are things like, called alternative dispute resolution systems and so on, which are being encouraged by international banks, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and so on, and which money is being put into, to get the, the courts stopping being clogged up with legal cases of the poor. Because actually, as far as they can, people of all backgrounds try and access legal systems for justice issues. And, the, and it's, it's very true, there is a problem. The courts don't work very well. They're corrupt, they're clogged up, and all sorts of things like that. But the solutions that are being proposed will reinvent all the problems of the formal courts with the added layer of problems of, of uh, using customary, traditional, and religious laws. And uh, in, in Africa, for instance, uh, systems of uh, chiefs' courts or... Um, uh, you know, other uh, jirgas in Pakistan, the Asian Development Bank had a huge program of funding jirgas. At precisely the time when the, when the, the rights activists, the human rights activists, such as Nazreen, and, you know, where, uh, when she lived in Pakistan, and women's rights activists, lawyers and so on, were fighting against the jirga system. In, in India, there are similar panchayat systems called khap panchayats, which have often ruled on um, um, uh, against people who've had inter-caste marriages or inter-religious marriages, um, and there's their sort of caste-based panchayats. Um, and again, you get uh, the UNDP commissioning expert reports about uh, using language like, how can these be made compliant with uh, in a human rights law? So what they're actually doing is saying, we're actually going to put money into these systems. 
And that is against the advice of the rights activists in the countries. So the issues that we are talking about in, in, when, we, when we complain about the Sharia councils and other parallel legal systems, and which, as, as Elam said very rightly, is like a sort of anthropological view of the law, these, these are being promoted in universities in this country and in America and elsewhere um, as reasonable as you know, only having minor problems that, that the, you know, issues of compliance are there, that the critics like us don't notice how they're actually working with the civil systems. And it's true, they do work with the civil systems. They work with the police. They work with the local councils. They will, you know, occasionally put up a post on domestic violence or something like this. And then the, the police officer who spent years trying to persuade them thinks this is marvelous. They've actually moved along. Now, one of the fallacies underlying this is that they think these are backward people and if we work really hard with them, they'll come forward because they've, you know, they're in this country and we must train them in the ways of this country a little bit, not too much, not rock the boat, but you know, they should get women to report domestic violence. There's a fundamental fallacy there. They're not backward. They're as British as anybody in this room. You know, there is Brit they're more British than I am. I am an immigrant. They're third generation. Let's be really clear that they came to this country and that these forms of law are now part of British Islam. Mm -hmm. They are, because British Islam as it's formally constituted, I'm not talking about British Muslims as individuals, I'm talking about the formal institutions of British Islam, are the Deoband, as Alam said, Jamaat Islami, Muslim Brotherhood, and a group that's recently been in the news called Khatmin Nabuwat whose sole aim is to talk about the finality of the Prophet and attack another sect within Islam, which they want to call non-Muslim, not only call, but legally exclude from their right to define themselves as they choose. And these are not marginal people. They have MBEs, they have knighthoods, they, have, they are in parliament. Mm -hmm. You know, these are part of the British establishment, and they have been made part of the British establishment by successive political parties. And, and they have their Hindu counterparts, who are also saying, who are part of the Hindutva movement, which is a Hindu far-right fascist movement, which is in power in India at the moment. And that movement has called legislation on caste discrimination in this country, cultural genocide. Mm -hmm. Hindus will die out if we recognize that caste discrimination is a reality in this country. That is what they're claiming. So th th what we're facing is not something that is just a few um, community leaders who haven't quite got the plot and a few trainings will sort them out. Mm -hmm. We're not facing that. We're facing highly organized political movements that have rooted themselves in Britain because, because they had their, their own plans and policies, but they also served the purposes of successive British governments and British states. Mm -hmm. And they're embedded in that system. And, and at the same time, we're facing the state reversing, and this is the Tory state and not, the, not Labour, reversing some of the gains that Labour put in place uh, in the earlier period, the Human Rights Act, and, and a legal aid system which Britain touts as the best in the world. Britain trains other people in legal aid. And what, what, what somebody fighting around the legal aid system said now said that we can't any longer say, come and look at our system, this is what we've got, and, and bring people here so that they look at it because we have destroyed our own system while trying to talk about it in others. Because British aid, on the one hand, will be supporting fundamentalists, but on the other hand, does do some good things and supports grassroots legal organizations and uh, legal aid for the poor and so on. They're, it's a complicated system. What it's doing is promoting the worst and, and running down the best. So while we have a huge struggle ahead of us, the people who understand this struggle are men and women in different parts of the world who are upholding secular principles and in the face of massive terrorism and attacks on their rights are actually struggling for their rights within, uh, against all these things. They understand it perfectly well. Women in Somalia or Sudan or Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Iran, uh, Afghanistan understand this stuff. They stand with us 
you know, we have their solidarity in this country. They stand with us because they've been experiencing it and they've seen the effects of aid policies and, and various kinds of war on terror policies and uh, that, that, that they're experiencing. So they stand with us and we can call on their, their solidarity for us. It's not just our solidarity for them, but their solidarity for us because they know what's happening. It has been happening to them for longer than it's happening to us. So this is a global movement that we're facing. It's a very British problem, but it's a global problem and we can stand with other people as we fight it. Thank you. If you raise your hands and tell me who you, what the question is and who for, please. Hi, uh, I'm Bob Reid. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, can you come to the front because yeah, we're videotaping the conference. Thank you. Uh, Bob Reid, uh, and the, the issue that I really was talking about was regarding the, uh, oh, yeah. the argument that you're using regarding the Human Rights Act. Mm -hmm. um, are you in danger of legitimising Sharia courts by using the Human Rights Act because it only applies to a public authority and therefore you're legitimising it as part of the state itself. Who's sorry? Nareen? Nazreen. Nazreen, sorry. I was in fact uh, giving the background to the law and in fact I think that there is, as I said, a very fuzzy area there because with the right to practice your religion and faith and belief, you are in a sense, not in a sense, you are in fact giving grist to uh, these religious organizations. And that is why I ended very firmly by talking about equality and equity before the law. So the law should actually not deal with religion. That is why we want a secular space that the state and law must be separate from religion, is what I was arguing. And in fact, I would say that the law as it stands, whether it's the European Convention, whether it's uh, the Human Rights Act, religion should be out. Yeah. But none of that applies to the Human Rights Act. Because, no, the Human Rights Act gives you the freedom. No, no, to that, that's to protect the, what the Human Rights Act does, is stop the state from impinging on those rights. It doesn't stop... It doesn't give you a right to assert that. It just stops the state from impinging upon it. Well, if the state doesn't impinge on it, what it does is it enables, is the point that I'm making. And that's what the state historically has been doing in this country, and which even before in colonial times, the British state, now we're talking about the British state, we're not talking about all European states. Yeah. The British state and the colonial state, its modus operandi was a communitarian discourse on communal bases where, at, where it looked at Indians as religious entities, Muslims, Hindus mainly, and then Sikhs and others. So what I'm saying is that there's a genealogy of embodying communities as religious communities. And what I'm saying is that that has to stop because the only time that you can be equal before the law is if all other mediators disappear and you're just equal citizens as equal human beings. So I'm not saying don't be Muslim. I'm not saying don't be Christian. Be whatever you want to be. But in the eyes of the law, you are a citizen with equal rights, regardless of gender, religion, etc., etc., etc. I'd like to actually, actually you talk to Prime Minister. Would you like to respond as well? Um, I'll wait, Prime Minister. Here, take that. I think, I think fundamentally, we're talking about two aspects. Um, or uh, where the clash occurs. Freedom from religion and freedom to religion. Right? So freedom of the right to, right to manifest religion. What are the boundaries of that? And uh, Nazreen earlier pointed to the fact that the freedom to manifest religion comes as a qualified right. 
So it is not an absolute right. And she said, she listed the kind of areas that qualifies the right to manifest religion, which is, you know, some dubious uh, phrases around moral uh, character. I can't remember that list now. So but the limitation uh, list. The limitation list. The qualification yes. list. Yes, the fuzzy but list. But at the end of it, it also says, insofar as it doesn't impinge on other rights. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what we're talking about here is where the right to manifest religion clashes with, say, gender equality, <coughs> women's rights, sex discrimination. Does the right to manifest religion, which is invoked by the religious right as a way of, um, of maintaining a very regressive identity, communal identity, does that right trump the right, other rights? And the question, is, and the answer is no, it cannot. And it is on that basis that we have been able to challenge, for example, the Sharia, Sharia laws, uh, the, the law mm -hmm. society and the Sharia compliant mm -hmm. laws, because we argued that the equalities legislation in the UK has to prevail, prevail, yeah? And that where the law society was in breach of the equalities legislation, particularly the sex discrimination laws, then that was unlawful. And so, in a you know, so I don't, I'm not quite sure whether that answers I your I, question. I think we're talking at cross purposes. Cross purposes. Yeah, I think yeah. The thing is that the, the law society is yeah. is a public authority. It, yeah. it provides a public function. Absolutely, which Whereas, is why we're able to challenge it. But a Sharia court is two individuals. No, but what, wait, 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 no, no, you're, you're, you're mistaking. So our, when we talk about human rights violations that go on in Sharia councils, we're talking about human right, uh, rights violations of the individuals who go there. Yeah. They have rights. Yeah. Okay? So where they are told um, that they don't have a right to divorce, or, uh, or only be granted a divorce if they agree to waive their rights to property, to maintenance, to children, and so on. That's a violation of their human rights. That is something... How is the state violating their... Because the state, as Nazreen pointed out, facilitates this. So it's facilitating very discriminatory parallel legal systems that violate human rights to flourish. No, no, it's making a mission. It's facilitated by, by sorry, a Sorry, can we not go yeah, back and sorry. forth? Let's just... Uh, yeah. you, well, yeah. I think yeah. I've answered the question, question actually. Respond, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think we're talking slight. Can I, can I answer that? Wait. Can I have the mic? I, I think you ask a crucial question. The issue is not that we, we want to legitimize the Sharia courts by the back door or by challenging them. I think that was your question. Uh, well, implied in your question yeah. that in, that that they are not a public body, no. and 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 that by saying that the Human Rights Act applies to them as a public body, we're in effect recognizing them as a public body. I think no, that no. that was your yeah. question, right? So our issue is with the state allowing them to be charities and doing other things. That the 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 what we haven't decided on a litigation strategy. Okay. Um, this is an opportunity to have a conversation about one. But I think what we are on the platform very, very clear about is that we do not treat them as public bodies, either exactly. by the front door or exactly. the back door. Exactly. What we are doing is talking, and that's why a lot of all our contributions uh, talked about the enabling role of the state. Mm. The British state and the British government currently, even when it's expressing concern about Sharia Council, stands by like a wide-eyed observer, as if they've just sprung up like mushrooms and they had nothing to do with it. But they have been given charitable status in some cases. So they have had a very key role in enabling and facilitating them. Our, our fight in that case, in terms of using the Human Rights Act, we have other strategies directly to do with the Sharia Councils, but the, using the Human Rights Act is a fight with the British state and its discriminatory policies. Okay, can we? I just want a quick interjection on that. I think that what you've actually, what you're asking is something that I actually touched upon. It is a conundrum because on the one hand, and, and that is a very complex legal problem because on the one hand, European law and British law is saying that you have the freedom to practice your religion. And on the other hand, 
what we are saying is, hang on, freedom to practice your religion actually impinges on certain inherent freedoms which are there in British law. So there is, a, there is absolutely a conflict which you've hit upon. There's a problem there, no? Of course there's a problem. The European law is positive. You, you're given a right to do something. Whereas in, in British law, you can, you're free to do anything you like as long as the law doesn't legislate for it. Can we move on to another question? It's OK. Of course there's a problem. Who would like to ask another question? Yes. But that's just would, you, would you like to just stand there and okay. you mention that okay? legal firms are encouraging the Islamic sections within the big legal firms. Mm -hmm. So I wondered in that case, are these qualified lawyers that they're having? Mm -hmm. yeah. And are the universities then promulgating also this kind of teaching? Because I assume that these lawyers come via a university system. Yeah. So has anyone ever looked into what's actually being taught sure. in our universities? There you go. Okay. Um, yes, I mean you're going to answer that. Well, the firms that I'm referring to, and I'm probably going to get sued now because I've named one of them. Um, I've got nothing, so I'll put that out there. Um, <laughs> they can have. They can have the cat. Um, we're talking about some of the best legal firms in this country. So you've got Islamic law divisions. So Aina Khan, who was the solicitor who I, I mentioned, you, she's she's on sort of your TV a lot, and um, she focuses on family matters. So she tries to facilitate Islamic divorces, um, you know, maintenance within an Islamic framing on on the grounds of divorce. But we now have Sharia compliant mortgages, and as Ellen said, you know, about Sharia councils that they're a recent thing from. Um, the 80, 1980s onwards. When my dad came here in the 50s, he didn't get a Sharia compliant mortgage. You know, um, mm. Sharia compliant finance, um, Sharia compliant banking. I, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and these are big legal firms. Islamic law is an academic subject. It will be being taught, it is taught in, in universities in this country. Um, as you would teach, I don't know, European law, as you would teach customary laws, you would teach different, you know, um, different sort of um, schools of jurisprudence, sort of different legal framings. So we're not talking about some kind of s a person who's just set up in a back street with some dodgy certificate. We're talking about the very best legal professionals, but who um, are exploiting a loophole, I guess. Um, I mean, the thing about these firms is that they don't necessarily employ people who've done so-called Islamic law, they employ scholars, or they've, they've deferred to scholars, or people who are experts in Islamic law. That's how they deal with the matter. So the law society, when it drew up its Sharia-compliant wills, didn't have lawyers, you know, who they, they, they uh, spoke to certain experts. And that was one of the things that we challenged them on. We said, well, who are your experts? Who are these so-called scholars? that have given you these really highly regressive interpretations of, of Sharia, so-called Sharia. And um, can we see that kind of transparency there? And of course, they didn't let on who they were seeking advice from and who they're seeking um, you know, their views from. So it's kind of quite hazy in terms of exactly who they consult. But we know that they're not consulting women or the vulnerable or the very people who are impacted by this. What we know is that they've got their specialist experts. Um, Aina Khan happens to be a lawyer, but she also claims to be an expert on Sharia. And so she combined both those roles quite effectively, if you think about it, very effectively, and corners a niche market, you know, and creates a demand and then seeks to service that demand. And that's exactly what's happening. I mean, all these kind of Sharia compliant mortgages, Sharia compliant commercial, um, you know, solutions, Sharia compliant law, uh, law in other areas. What they do is they're actually creating a market for this. So I think we've got to also look at not only what fundamentalism is doing, but how they're using the tools of marketing or of delivery of law and services and capturing the market and meeting the needs that they have created in the first place. Okay, thank you. Yasmin, do you want to say yeah. something? Uh, I think to go back to uh, Sharia law, uh, 
we should actually get out of the habit of just referring to one Sharia law because it's so hugely contested. And for instance, we heard a lot today about um, the right of uh, the guardian to marry his or her daughter off. Now in Pakistan, where on the whole, uh, women's rights uh, after Ziaul Haq in the 80s and the family laws ordinance are quite abhorrent uh, and women are really, uh, they have half the rights of any man. Uh, there is a judgment of the Supreme Court in a case called Humaira, where the Supreme Court of Pakistan has stated very clearly that a woman does not need the permission of her guardian to marry. And so th there is a lot of differences in various Sharia laws. But I think I, I want to come back to something that we haven't actually touched upon, which is very important since we're talking about education, is faith schools. Yeah. Now, um, post uh, a Runnymede commission in the 90s on uh, Islamophobia, Jack Straw, who was Home Secretary at that time in the Labour government, pushed through this ordinance that you could have Muslim faith schools as well. Obviously, the argument that they ran was that in the interest of equity, because you have Jewish faith schools and you have Christian faith schools, we cannot disestablish them, so we should have Muslim faith schools as well. Faith schools have charitable status. And as we've seen deplorably in the history of India and Pakistan, and as we saw, uh, and I'm speaking here as a historian of that period, the terrible riots that took place and the awful killings that happened in education institutions where Muslim and Hindu children and Sikh children, in fact, had been segregated in the name of religion, whether it was the Hindu Arya Samaj schools, whether it was the Muslim Anjumane Himayate Islam schools, or whether it was the Sikh Sabha schools. And really, we don't really know enough. Well, actually, we do uh, Nazri. Northern Ireland is a good example, example. of yes. what happened. Absolutely, absolutely, but Northern Ireland was the colonial paradigm. Yeah. Oh, Ireland was the colonial yes, paradigm. Was. Absolutely. Any more questions we can take? There's one at the back. My name is David. I'm not a Muslim. I'm a secularist and author of atheist. Um, and I probably speaking from a profound level of ignorance here. Um, can I go back to a slide that uh, Ellen showed earlier on this morning? And it was about uh, a contrast between Yemeni and Tunisian uh, interpretations of Sharia. Now, I assume that uh, Islam and Sharia go hand in hand. You can't have Islam without Sharia if you are a Muslim. So I would imagine that all Muslims would want to abide by some form of Sharia. Yeah. That's not true. So you can be a good Muslim and have nothing to do with Sharia yes. whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm quite confusing then. So. <laughs> do all Jewish people abide by do, do you abide What's by you supposed to abide by Sharia? Uh, aren't you supposed to? No. Who says? Who says? Who says? Okay, let's, Who? let's have people answering now. Uh, right. um, uh, uh, anyway, can, can, I, can, I, can I cut to the, the, uh, just my question? Yeah. And that is that uh, if you're unhappy with the way Sharia courts are running in this country, why don't they become... Why, why, aren't, they, why don't they rewrite Sharia? So if for Muslims in non-Muslim countries, so that Sharia complies with the law of the land they're living in. If, uh, as uh, Ellen was saying, Sharia is not God's law, it is something which is uh, created for whatever reason. That's the question. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, you know, the problem is, uh, when we hear the argument is that you cannot live as a Muslim without Sharia, I hear an Islamist argument. Yes. Because if you see, if you look at the writing of the founders of Islamist movements, Hassan al-Banna, Abu Ala al-Mawduri, al khumayni if you read their work, in all of their works, the one thing that they insist 
forget about what they're telling you. Islam is not only a religion. Islam is a life order, an order, a political order that, that um, governs every aspect of your life. So when you read that of Hassan al-Banna, who started in the 20s, 1920 and on over, you realize he was trying to counter a current where people were considering religion as a religion, an individual spiritual relationship between a human being and, an, uh, and a higher being. Okay? But over time, it became so mainstream that we come to a point where someone is telling me that I cannot be a Muslim without wanting Sharia. Sharia is a legal aspect and dimension of a religion. It can be reformed, we don't need it in order for us to perform our religion. And look at it as, as, a, kind, as, a, kind, as a kind of a legal um, proliferations that came in a certain period, and the Uthman Uthman uh, uh, Empire was trying to um, modernize it at the end of the 19th century, modernize it and secularize it. At that time, it wasn't so sanctioned. It wasn't holy. So from that perspective, yes, I can be, I practice my religion without a need for, for, uh, for a Sharia. Uh, one is uh, on the issue of a legal versus personal religion. I think when religion becomes part of the law or state, it's no longer a question of personal belief. It, it, it becomes very much linked to political power. And therefore, I think the fact that the Islamists want to make it seem as if a personal belief is the same as religious law or a religious state and halife really goes back to their aims uh, and, and the fact that they are making it seem as if this is the case in order to uh, put forth their own project you know and i think it, it's if we looked at if we looked at the world and even britain 40 years ago weren't there muslims living in this country yes did we have sharia courts then no how about in many countries now where there are Sharia courts, northern Nigeria, it didn't exist 30, 40 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, were women in Afghanistan dressed in borgas? No. Uh, was the niqab an issue in Tower Hamlets? No. So I think, but Muslims lived in, in these countries for centuries, for generations. So the fact of the matter is that there is definitely this need to see it linked with the Islamist movement, otherwise, we, we are basically saying that Muslims are the same as Islamists. I mean, saying, uh, like the English are all the same as um, the EDL. Uh, just two other things I want to say is, um, on the issue of interpretation, I think you mentioned about interpreting Sharia in a more friendly way. I mean, from my perspective, I think, of course, people have a right to interpret their religion in any way they want. I'm an atheist. I prefer not to even think about religion. I dislike religion. I think it's not a helpful thing to believe in. That's my personal belief. But I think in a society where we have non-religious and religious living alongside each other, if religious, the religious want to interpret their religion, that's great. But we need to work together, religious and non-religious, for a secular state and society and laws. So whatever your beliefs, however you want to interpret them, good on you, interpret them in any way you can, that's great. I'm not going to stand against that because I think anything to challenge the Islamist interpretation can be positive. And it's a way of putting holes in their argument. Nonetheless, we're only going to succeed if we work together for secular societies, states, and laws, and schools. Yes. Oh, just to add to what Mariam just said there, you know, the point about Sharia compliance with the laws of the land, the argument is that you don't just hear that that's actually, um, you know, a kind of um, uh, echoes a kind of fundamentalist um, arguments, but actually apologists are saying this exactly, that all you need to do is regulate these things, that if you regulate them and make them compliant, they're not a problem. I think there are two problems with this. At the political level, 
are you really going to tell me you're going to be able to regulate what are unaccountable, profoundly discriminatory structures that are set up precisely to be that? Yeah. Where they are set up to rule in accordance with divine law, what does that mean? That means it's absolute, it cannot be held to account because it's divine, it's above the law of the land. So, in, you know, so there are political reasons why regulation is not the answer. Um, and, the, and there are practical reasons why it's not the answer. Do you really think the government gives a toss that, that, that these second tier systems of, of justice are not complying with the law of the land? They don't give a toss. It's only people like us that are challenging it. And they're not going to be going around and they can't even afford their own formal legal system putting in place a regulatory framework to regulate second tier rubbish. They're just not going to do it. They're going to leave it to their to its own devices. And the trade-off is you, the religious right, maintain public order, and in return, we will allow you order over the family, over the community. We will give you communal autonomy so that you so that we can live in coexistence in this way. You do what you like, we'll turn a blind eye. As long as you're not bombing on the streets of London. That's the trade-off. That's the social contract. Yeah. And we say that women's bodies are not going to be used in this way by fundamentalists or by the state. This is not, you know, a game that we're playing. So, you know, they're not going to put in. It's a cash-strapped legal system. Can't afford legal aid. Can't afford proper scrutiny uh, frameworks. How is it going to scrutinize, you know, a bunch of, um, you know, self-appointed you know, pip, pipped up, you know, uh, squeaks that are sitting there <laughs> playing with power. They're just not going to do it. So, you know, regulation is not the answer. And if there's one message I want to give to people, when you encounter people saying, all we need to do is regulate and train them, and they can do a little bit of a better job, and they can be a bit more compliant, no, 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 no. We cannot have second-rate systems of justice. It is racist. Yeah. I thought Pragna was going to swear there. I've never heard her <laughs> swear in all the years I've known her. Um, David, I just want to pick up on a couple of things. One, it's not about making Sharia better for the West. There are people in non-Western, Muslim-majority countries who are fighting for a state legal system that isn't tied up in religion. We're focusing really heavily on Sharia, and I think rightly so, but can I just raise one issue around Ireland? The power of the church in Ireland still prohibits women seeking abortion. Mm -hmm. Women die in Ireland because of those laws. I lived in, in Southern Ireland for a little bit. You can't get contraception, at, well, you couldn't in the 90s when I lived there, unless you were married, as if people who aren't married don't have sex. <laughs> you know, um, you know, we, we need to be focusing on, on all religious laws and never get complacent about where our laws are. As Ellen said about Switzerland in 1988 and the family law changing, there are still, you know, the religious, I mean, there are 12 spaces in the House of Lords for the Church of England, plus all the other religious leaders. Faith schools have, you know, Nasreen's mentioned them. Faith school started, it's, an accident, it's a historical accident because the state were not providing education for the poor. So the churches, the Catholic churches, the Protestant churches stepped in. And now they're so powerful in terms of the land that they own, the money that they have, that breaking that stronghold is going to be nigh on impossible, but we will carry on the fight. So let's never get complacent that this is just Muslims and this is not everybody else. This is all of us. East, West, of faith, of no faith. It's mm -hmm. every single one of us. Thank you. Can I just say, I was brought up in the West of Scotland, uh, where yep. they, the schools were segregated. And uh, as a Protestant, we used to fight Catholic kids because they were different. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's just a disaster. Yeah. 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 OK. I'd like to say it's about uh, 60 odd years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. We haven't got long left, but we are going to ask Ellen to wrap it up, really, and to give us recommend her recommendations that I'm sure you've written about in the book. I haven't had the chance to read it yet, so I'll just pass you that down. Thank you very much. And then we can open it up. 
I think in order to solve um, a problem, we have to know the, the causes for it. Why women are going to get up in the conflict. And they would like to have a divorce. So from this perspective, I'm starting with this. Um, make it mandatory to have a civil marriage before contracting a religious marriage. And implement this ruling with clear and harsh sanctions for any imams or individuals who violate it. And launch a nationwide campaign to register all Islamic marriages. I'm focusing about the issue of Islamic marriages before we're talking about it here. Okay? But please, register all Islamic marriages. And this will ultimately reveal many polygamous marriages. The women who are parties to these marriages, to, to these marriages, and their children should be protected. But that protection should not entail recognizing polygamy as a form of marriage, as some essentialist legal scholars are arguing. Mm -hmm. Punish the Muslim man who is involved in polygamous marriages in the same way that the UK legal system would punish a Christian, Jewish, or atheist man doing the same. Attached to the British court, but I don't know how this would be, system, a unit with local branches nationwide that is authorized to automatically issue an Islamic divorce after the civil divorce because re religiously it's sound. It will be a religious divorce if you have a civil divorce. Um, if you ha after the civil divorce has been issued, in many Islamic countries, the religious authorities recognize a civil divorce as religiously valid, and the situation should be the same here in the UK. Launch a nationwide campaign that reaches women within close communities to inform them about their rights, the importance and protection of civil marriage, the need to register their marriage, and how the law functions in the UK. And please, abolish the parallel re uh, religious legal systems in the UK and the work of Sharia courts, treat citizens and migrants as equal before the law. Treat them as individuals, not as groups. Mm -hmm. And from this perspective, one law for all is a protection for all of us, just as secular, just as secular. Mm -hmm. These are basically my recommendations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, after hearing and has and has anybody else any other recommendations? Okay, I'm going to come back to you on a second. I think we'll just take something from the audience. What would you like to say? Okay, sorry, can you come forward? Don't <laughs> <laughs> turn the camera around, boy. And if, uh, if I may so just basically, uh, uh, I think it's very important. It's um, and something that I learned when I was in South Africa. And I've spoken with many men and women who participated in the anti-apartheid system. And they said something that I learned a lot from. They said uh, alliances. Yes. Alliances. And from this perspective, so we have to, to create a, a wide alliance and stop being divided along ideological uh, your left, your right. No, because I think we are. We can work together. As long as we share this platform of human rights, as long as we share this belief that we are equal before the law. So from this perspective, working together, we, you worked in Canada, uh, Maria, mm -hmm. and you managed to actually um, um, uh, stop uh, the, the introduction of Islamic law uh, uh, in Ontario, mm -hmm. and it was basically because of the way you, you, you managed to, to create a big alliance that included also Muslim women organizations. 
And I wish that the Muslim Women Organization, that the, the one in the, the, the network, would be also part of this alliance mm -hmm. and inform. Here, each one of us has to work with their local um, politicians. My local politician is complete wanker. <laughs> <laughs> And work with them, really, create a coalition. And, and we have to start with somewhere. And you, you started when nobody was talking about it, you know? That's what makes your work very important. And from this, I'm sure we will reach there. But it's just, be, we have to be basically patient, persistent, and believe, believe in what you're doing. Which you do. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle, really. Can I, can I just say, oh, yeah, sorry. We, we are actually an alliance of ex-Muslims, Muslims, and other and atheists and various <laughs> backgrounds. And that has taken some building up. And it took a long time, much longer than it happened. In Canada, it happened much earlier. And they did achieve success and absolutely take heart from that. So our door is open, I think. Our door is open to anybody that wants to sign up to our principles. But unfortunately, there are groups that, that have not chosen to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's the di differences, obviously, with Canada because uh, religion is much more deeply entrenched here in Britain. So when we're fighting for a secular legal system, we, we also are fighting for a secular society in this country. We've got bishops in the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. We've got the Church of England is an established church. So there is a lot of privilege for religion, all kinds of religion. And that's why when there's discussion around equality, it's about equality of religions, mm -hmm. not equality of people and citizens. So I think that's why we've got a much more difficult fight. I think also, in Canada, one of my uh, comrades led that fight, uh, also on the left like myself, but sh no one knew she was an ex-Muslim. And so I think if the, the problem is uh, we started this campaign after the Council of Ex-Muslims. And the truth is that there are quite a lot of Muslim organizations that don't want to work with ex-Muslims. And I think it's unfortunate. I, I mean, I think it's very brave for some Muslims to come and sit alongside <laughs> us. Uh, and I think that's great. This is, these are new steps for us, actually. But, and I think um, you know, th those groups that don't want to work with ex-Muslims should think about how much that is also part of the Islamist narrative. That, yeah, you know, in absolutely. fact, all of us, Muslim, ex-Muslim, non-Muslim, uh, minority religions, uh, no religions, uh, across the world, we face the same problem, which is Islamism, whether it's uh, in its various dimensions, whether it's terrorism, uh, there's a Paris and Brussels every day in the Middle East or North Africa, whether it is Sharia laws, gender segregation, the status of women, human beings, uh, the, the denial of free expression, conscience, and what have you, any basic human rights is a contradiction to their rule and to wh where they have influence. So I think we need to work together. We have been building an alliance. It is a very slow, painful process. And we're not only uh, faced with uh, you know, the sort of uh, those on the left that side with the Islamists. So we, we have a funny uh, story where we had a demonstration in front of Downing Street against Sharia law. And the English Defense League had come to do a counter demonstration um, against al Mahajarun, which was the Islamist group uh, who was counter-demonstrating against us. <laughs> and uh, what, was, what was fantastic was, you know, we were all shouting there, women's rights, equality, and all these young people uh, from Unite Against Fascism came and joined, uh, were, were marching. And I got really excited because, yes, we are the anti-fascists. We're the real ones. We're anti the Islamist fascists, and we're also anti the EDL and Pegida and all those other fascists. But what did they do? They shouted Allah Akbar and they joined Al Mahajarun. And that honestly I, it made me cry because those are those have those should be our allies, you know, and there's so many who are consider themselves progressive, who should be on our side. They are betraying left principles of criticizing religion, of defending secularism, and defending citizenship irrespective of your beliefs, background and, and any boundaries and borders that divide us. So 
that some of that left is coming around because we represent the real left. Let, let's be very clear about that. Amen. But also, <laughs> and, uh, and also, of course, uh, and whilst I agree with Elham, we have to create a mass movement that includes everybody and anybody that agrees with us and agrees with this mission, irrespective of whether we like them or not. And trust us, we all work with people that we don't like. Politically, of course, we respect people as human beings. But, uh, but there, there is this line, and it is the far right for me, you know, because they, they are anti-Sharia, and they cry crocodile tears for, for Muslim women, yet they deny the right to asylum for women fleeing uh, Islamists fleeing uh, the, the horrors of uh, life under the Islamic State, it, the regimes in Iran, Pakistan, what have you, uh, Algeria, wherever they, they fled from. And they also um, are there not because they care about equality or secularism, but they're defending a white Christian Europe against us brown savage hordes. And so, uh, you know, they are the same to me as the Islamists. They're the other side of the coin of that, uh, of that movement. So this movement is open for everybody and anybody. And we, we, need, we need lots and lots of people in order to win. So if you're not active with us yet, well, you know, you, you have to be tomorrow. You have no choice. We have your names. Um, yeah, I, I suppose would like to make uh, two uh, closing remarks. One is, again, about uh, education in general, but more specifically about, I think, the ignorance about uh, the general ignorance today uh, about preconceived notions about what is Islam, who are Muslims, and Muslim communities and societies. And there's a long, long, long history in Islamic countries and Muslim countries or countries where Islam has been present for several centuries, like India, for example, where if the literary traditions, uh, the, uh, the high and low lit literary traditions, um, and I use the terms very advisedly, the butt of jokes was always the mullah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? He was the butt of jokes. And in high literary traditions, in classical Urdu poetry, for example, the poet was always having a clash with God and disputing the nature and existence of God. And I uh, quickly quote, and those who know Urdu will probably understand, uh, and those who don't, I make a rough and bad translation. Mirza Ghalib, I think a lot of you have heard his name. Khuda ke vaste parda na kabe se utha zalim kahi aisa na ho ya bhi wohi kafir sanam nikle. For God's sake, don't lift the curtain of the Kaaba because who knows, you may find those very same idols over there. Okay? So that's the great Ghalib. He wasn't stoned. The second point that I want to make Only is... Only one stone. <laughs> 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 Thank you. He was, he, was, he was famously asked that, are you, are you a Muslim? So he said, only half. <laughs> so the person said, what do you mean? He said, well, I don't eat pork, but I drink. <laughs> but anyway... Um, I have a certain, I suppose, plea to make as a British Muslim... Uh, supporting secular democracy. I think that with a focus simply and merely on Islam, as there is today, in a climate of intense Islamophobia, it makes Muslims feel very insecure. And a lot of Muslims feel that they are under a particular lens, being scrutinized and labeled, and their lives are very difficult. And I know for myself, <coughs> that racist attacks on me as a Muslim woman, which I'd never faced before in England. I've lived here for 43 years. I encounter them today. So I think that this focus on Islam, A, intensifies Islamophobia, but also makes Muslims feel insecure. But thirdly, is also unfair, because other religions and other <laughs> social groups and even liberal groups, I mean, liberal tyranny could be as oppressive as religious tyranny, are actually uh, creating problems for democracy, for equality. 
in this country. So I think, yes, Sharia has to be challenged. I think anything that takes away and erodes uh, equality has to be challenged in whatever form and whatever guise. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. I just want to pick up on what Elham said about Muslim oh, women's sorry. groups. Um, I don't know what the picture of Muslim women's groups are on the continent, but I think I have to say something. I couldn't sit here in all honesty and not address this issue. Mm -hmm. Over the past decade, um, perhaps longer, the funding mm -hmm. for protecting women has been funneled into faith groups. I never identified as a Muslim until I was absolutely forced to because it was something that was very private. I didn't need to wear it publicly. And um, having worked on forced marriage on a base violence, domestic violence for 30 years, there's been this general progression. You can't access services as a minority woman or even as a minority man unless you go down this faith road, mm -hmm. whether that's to get protection because you, you want mm -hmm. to flee violence or whether you're, okay. an, you're an older person and you want to go to a day centre. Mm -hmm. You can't go unless you will go to a particular religious group. Some of the religious organisations and the, the Muslim women's groups are very active in, t in terms of trying to modernize the mosques and modernize the mosque stru structures, and that's, that's great. But there is this great divide between who is a good enough Muslim and who is not a good enough Muslim. Mm -hmm. And this is not an MD Shia Sunni thing. No. This is not about MDs. This is across the board. This, board. Is, this is within MD, MD groups. This is within Sunni groups. This is within Shia groups. Mm -hmm. We have lost secular women's organizations. When I needed to access help for myself, there were groups like SBS. I would have happily gone to. There was, a, there was refuge provision that was secular. There is not that space anymore. Even within mainstream organizations, they funnel you down these crazy roads of, you know, you will want to be somewhere where your faith is respected. Yes, where my faith is respected, but not where any, a particular interpretation of that faith is imposed upon me. Gita said that, you know, we're open to everyone. Of course we are, we need to work with everyone, but I will always remain cautious. Always remain cautious because they're really clever, these Islamists that all of these extremists are really clever. We have to be vigilant because they have been able to um, get into the establishment and create whatever they want to do. They will do the same with us. We have to be cautious and have to be vigilant. I'm sorry to always be the arbiter of doom, but I just <laughs> felt that I had to say this. Well, okay. we'll be closing the meeting. Yeah. If, I, if I may just please, yeah. just one, one, one. Uh, just wanted to make sure to say that you understand my comment correctly. The last thing I would say is to work with Islamists. The last thing. I wasn't saying oh, Islamist. Yeah. I was saying even generally okay. faith-based no, groups. Very yeah. Important. Yeah. No. no well, absolutely course, not. That. Uh, they have a certain kind of a worldview and they have an agenda. They have mm -hmm. a strategy and they know how to infiltrate mm -hmm. organizations, states, c companies. You just name it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But th that said, um, what I meant with that is that a coalition mm -hmm. of partners of different groups with different ideological backgrounds. Mm -hmm. It's the one thing that kept, that will give mm -hmm. our movement strength, Important. and it is it is expanding, as you're saying. Yeah. So if you remember how it started, and right now where you are, the same. So uh, that's just basically. I just wanted to, to make sure that no one understands it in a different way. Yeah, no, no one understands. Absolutely, I think that was probably a wonderful debate. To be honest okay. with you, it was absolutely okay. brilliant listening to you. Did you want to say something else? No. Right. Yeah. The. In the panel. I just wanted to say I heard something, um, I think it was Yasmin Ali Brown who said that we're a dying breed. I think it was in that programme, um, what Muslim thing? I don't think so. You know, sitting here, I don't think we're a dying breed. So can you please all raise your hands and give these ladies a very, very good <laughs> Thank you for your
Oh, and thank you to the audience as well. Absolutely. <laughs> you were brilliant. <laughs> I would like to thank Ellen Lanyard for her groundbreaking work on Sharia law, and we look forward to see her work create a new paradigm shift in the conversation of women's rights in the UK. Our special thanks to Kate Smartway for her brilliant performance today, and this conference would not have been possible without the excellent help from our volunteers who have worked throughout the, throughout, up to the end of this conference to make this a very brilliant event. So I would like to thank Atusa, Aileen, Imad, um, Jalil, Faribos for his brilliant technical support, and uh, Pune and Irene as well. And last but not the least, I'd like to thank all of our lovely guests for making it today and making this fantastic event. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a good evening, and I'll hopefully see you next year. Thank you. Yeah.